Bruce. The issue of capital punishment has been discussed more often than ever by condemned men over the past few weeks. Each man personally realizes that in the next few months his fate will be decided, or at least put in some perspective. I think most of us have lived so long under so much uncertainty, compounded by so much doubt and suspicion, until we feel totally alienated from optimism. We have ingloriously been reduced to creatures subsisting in a daily routine that is so stifled with boredom that we tend to shun the light of hope as the owl would shun the daylight. It is now early morning in death row at Angola prison. Most of its 41 men are still asleep. Those awake try to protect their darkness by pinning sheets to the bars of their cells. Breakfast is still hours away. They must wait, as they must also wait the day of their executions. There is above glaring lights never turned off. In front, electrically controlled steel doors, and to the sides, walls of concrete blocks relieved only by their own simple crafts and calendars. Those of us on the outside can only dimly imagine the anguish of this waiting, the despair of facing time unrelieved and unending. There have been no executions in Louisiana since 1961. At that time, the state attempted twice to electrocute a teenage boy, Willie Francis. After an unsuccessful first execution, Willie was taken back to his cell. The Supreme Court was to rule that it is not unconstitutional to send a man twice to his death. And the state successfully completed its case. Willie Francis died. Some of these men were on the row at the time of Willie's death. Men who sat in these cells for 14 years waiting to die waiting for the courts and legislature to decide when they shall die. The question these men ask is why they must die, and as they wait, that is the question we must ask ourselves. The man who has committed the crime of murder or rape, says our state, should be brought to justice, should be put to death. In 1963, one of the last years many states used the death penalty, there were 21 persons executed in the United States. In the same year, there were 8,404 cases of murder and non-negligent manslaughter, not to mention the thousands of rapes and other capital offenses. These are odds of better than 400 to 1 against a murderer or rapist paying the death penalty. If we explore the causes of this kind of justice, we find striking differences between those who are finally put to death and those who are given lesser sentences. Said the late warden Lewis E. Laws of Sing Sing Prison, In the twelve years of my wardenship, I have escorted 150 men and one woman to the death chamber and the electric chair. In ages, they ranged from 17 to 63. They came from all kinds of homes and environments. In one respect, they were all alike. All were poor, and most of them friendless. It is a fact that a defendant of wealth and position never goes to the electric chair, the gas chamber, or the gallows. His lawyer will present his case with every favorable aspect, using all loopholes, while the poor defendant usually has a lawyer assigned by the court. Well, uh, I was associate warden of a prison in Iowa for several years. Then in 1965, I came to Tennessee and I was warden of the state prison in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, in 1968, I came to Louisiana. And since that time, I've been uh, warden of the state penitentiary at Angola. In fact, the last man that was executed in Iowa, his body wasn't even claimed uh, he had no friends or relatives that, that we knew of. I believe that, as well as I remember, he grew up in a, an orphanage 
and uh, more or less had been institutionalized all of his life. For the friendless and poor, the burden and quality of defense falls upon the court-appointed lawyer. They must be capable of defending these men. But do the facts support this assertion? The following is an excerpt from another letter written by an inmate currently on death row at Angola. My court-appointed attorney showed no interest in defending my case properly. At no point in my trial did he show real interest in the case. From the time he was appointed, I spoke to him twice. One time for about five minutes. The next time I saw him was the day before my trial began. For Angola in 1972, the evidence is in. The trials are over as the juries have reached the decision to execute these men. They wait the day through the years in their cells of eight by six. Will the deaths of these few waiting men serve the cause of justice? There remains the nagging but significant problem of the finality of such retribution. Once a sentence has been enacted, there can be no new evidence introduced in behalf of the convicted. No one may step up and say that in reality it was he who committed the crime. There is no room for error in this form of punishment. Yet errors do occur, and not infrequently. Several hundred innocent convictions for capital offenses have been documented by such men as Judge Jerome Frank of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. In most cases, these convictions have been upheld unanimously by the appellate courts, only to be reversed later in the light of new evidence. In some cases, these convictions have been due to the physical similarities between the defendants and the actual criminals found later. But all too often, this is not the case. I think this was true in the Texas case several years ago. Um, the style of the case, I don't remember offhand, but I think it was established after the man had been executed that he was, in fact, innocent. Uh, of course, uh, this is something when you take a man's life that you can't correct. If you take good time from him, as we do sometimes in the administration of the prison, this is something you can return. If he's given a sentence of any sort and found to be innocent, uh, it can be corrected through the courts or by executive clemency. Those on death row are not only poor, but they are also mainly black. Of the 41 men awaiting death today in Louisiana, 34 of them are black, and between 1930 and 1961, of the 133 men executed, 103 of them were black men. In short, as it is now applied, the death penalty is nothing but an arbitrary discrimination against an occasional victim. It cannot ever be said that it is reserved as a weapon of retributive justice for the most atrocious criminals for it is not necessarily the most guilty who suffer it. We, who are the jurors, are faced with this kind of situation. When the deaths of these men have passed, we will have placed ourselves in the all-seeing position and have decided that without doubt these men were guilty, that no new evidence could ever be introduced which would exonerate them. Only those of us who are willing to advocate capital punishment are allowed by law to serve on juries which decide capital cases. When faced by the death penalty, the strategy of the defense in the face of the overwhelming legal advantages of the state thus becomes one of not proving the innocence of the defendant, but of avoiding this penalty by pleading guilty for lesser sentencing. And there is no swift justice here. We force these men into five, ten, or fifteen years of waiting through the sentencing which we have passed on them in a most arbitrary yet socially sanctioned game of Russian roulette. The morning continues on death row. The men can play solitaire. They join their neighbors' hands in other games. The example of their deaths was claimed to be a deterrent to violent crime. But the facts are that they and thousands have not been deterred by the threat of the death penalty. Of the 14 states which have abolished the death penalty, none has higher rates of violent crime than the other states around them. Evidence exists to support the idea that the most violent crimes occur in moments of passion when no consideration of penalty occurs at all, and most significantly in the southern states 
which have generally higher incidences of capital punishment, there is also a higher per capita rate of violent crimes. What the evidence ultimately suggests is that forces other than fear of death affect the incidence of violence. In the armed forces, the Navy hasn't executed anyone in 150 years, while the Army, if my memory serves me correctly, has executed approximately 400 people. And I don't think any of us would say that there's more crime in the Navy than there is in the Army. I think people uh, who commit first-degree murder or any other capital crime don't expect to be caught to begin with. In some cases, they may be emotionally ill. It does seem true that most are not capable of contemplating their own destruction and always believe that there will be a way out. And if you are fortunate enough to be wealthy, this is a well-founded belief. Someone once said that uh, in the Bible it said it was difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, but it was impossible for him to be sent to the gas chamber or the electric chair. At noon, the condemned men are allowed to walk the corridor to the shower. For 15 minutes each day, they live this freedom. 12.15... The freedom ends for one man. His waiting begins. It has been held that only the severity of the death penalty can protect our public from further crime of these men, and only by executing them can we protect our lives from their cancerous influence. Fortunately, evidence again overwhelmingly refutes this logic. Not only are these men convicted of murder and later paroled the least likely of any criminal group to recommit a serious crime, but as inmates, these men are model prisoners. We have very few problems with our people on death row. In fact, uh, I would assume that all of them, probably with the exception of two, could live in the general population. Today, they live alone in their cells. Even inside their cells, each man tries to maintain his dignity. There is no one to see or admire him. He is condemned to die. He tries to live until the day the state decides he must die. He must not commit suicide before that day. Between 1930 and 1961 in New York State, 63 first-degree murderers were released on parole. 61 of these men had been sentenced to death, but had had their sentences commuted to life imprisonment and paroled. But the succeeding year, 1962, only one of these men had committed another crime, that of burglary. Yet the rate of recidivism for all parolees in this same study was 41%, of which 22.8% were technical violations and 18.2% were for criminal arrest. The same was true in California, where between 1945 and 1954, only 2.6% of those first-degree murderers that were paroled committed new felonies. Again, this figure represents the lowest rate for any class of parolees. Parolees convicted of other crimes registered a sharp increase in felony recidivism. A prisoner has written, Maybe because I've been so deeply isolated in the dungeon of meaninglessness, where one's manhood is castrated with the clang of his cell door, and where one's personal significance in the face of an emptiness in life and a nothingness after death must be found in near total subjective introversion. But I definitely feel that the judicial moratorium on capital punishment is near its end. Hope belongs to the optimist, indifference to the fatalist, and despair to the pessimist. And as might be expected, indifference and despair are the kings of death row. This man is over 40 years of age. The reasons for these excellent parole records and low recidivism rates must surely be affected by the fact that not only are most of these men older than other offenders when they are convicted of murder, but after serving longer sentences, they are often much older when released. An infinitesimal number of first-degree murders are committed by professional and habitual criminals. The degree of premeditation that goes into such an act is impossible to gauge. The wild crimes of witless passion are far, far more ordinary. According to numerous prison officials, murderers do not represent a danger to either the prison guards or employees. As the late warden of Sing Sing describes them, 
I believe that nearly all wardens are united in agreeing that as a group, life prisoners constitute the most reliable and dependable men in the institution. In a great majority of cases, the murderer is not a criminal in his nature as we ordinarily understand this term. Given places of trust and responsibility, as they often are, these men invariably make good. Out of sight and mind, these men shall be executed. What is our goal in criminal justice? Is it nothing more than revenge? It is a logical conclusion that a society which condones the use of violence in death to deal with its problems will influence its citizens to use violence to solve their problems. The two feed on each other and justify each other. Thus, the state of Louisiana must learn to deal humanely with its conflicts. Perhaps then we, its citizens, will follow its example. In the words of our warden, to all of us in the field of corrections, I don't know of anyone uh, uh, who was opposed to abolishing capital punishment. Having been so long lost in the labyrinths of despair, I often find it difficult to be anything but cynically skeptical of whether the peoples of the world will ever know the joys of true liberty. It seems that people in general are eager to confine themselves in the prison of abstraction, letting outmoded beliefs cage their growths as individuals. Let us answer his skepticism. Let us abolish this cruel and inhumane punishment today.